Hi, I'm Rich Dana. I'm very pleased and honored to be hosting a discussion between uh, two wonderful people, two experts in their field. And today we're going to be talking about the role of archives uh, in the work of writers and researchers. And um, if you've never been to special collections or to an archive, um, some of the stuff may surprise you. Uh, it can be a real adventure uh, finding primary source material for a project. And uh, both these people have a lot of experience uh, with this topic. We're joined today by Marilyn Brookwood. Marilyn is a psychologist who worked in public education to help adolescents improve academic and personal competence. She was a member of the faculty at the College of New Rochelle in New York and wrote guides for teachers and counselors about adolescent challenges. In 2008, she earned her third postgraduate degree in Harvard University's Mind, Brain, and Education program. I'm also joined by David McCartney. David is the University of Iowa archivist. Uh, he's celebrating his 20th anniversary in that position this year. So congratulations, David. Congratulations, David. Um, Thank you. After receiving his undergraduate degree in journalism from University of Wisconsin-Madison, David was a reporter for radio stations, both in around the Midwest and in Alaska. He received an MA in history and a master's degree in library and information science, both from the University of Maryland at College Park. And he is the past president of the Midwest Archives Conference. So welcome to both of you today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, exactly. Marilyn has just completed a book. Uh, it's called The Orphans of Davenport. And uh, I'd like to just introduce you to the topic by reading a brief blurb from Publishers Weekly. Uh, they write that psychologist Brookwood debuts with a lucid and immersive history of how researchers in the 1930s Iowa refuted prevailing notions about childhood development. She focuses on Iowa Child Welfare Research Station psychologists Harold Skeels and Marie Skodak and their studies comparing children who had, quote, barren, affectionless, detached childhoods, unquote, at a state orphanage in Davenport, Iowa, with those who received individual attention, play, and encouragement as temporary wards at an institution for the, quote, feeble-minded, unquote. The latter group of children showed a remarkable improvement in their IQ scores, buttressing the Iowa researchers' argument that genetics was not the sole factor in intelligence. Brookwood provides insight into the Iowa researchers' methods and skillfully draws from primary sources to explain how racist and classist attitudes and fierce criticism from the era's eugenicists prevented the station's groundbreaking studies from initially gaining traction. It wasn't until the 1960s that the findings by Skeels, Skodak, and other station researchers entered the mainstream, helping to launch learning programs such as Head Start. So, Marilyn. Yeah. Um, can you start by telling us a little bit about how you became aware of the story of the orphans of mm -hmm. Davenport and how this relates to the work that you were doing at the time? Sure. Um, you know, you know, you never know where the path is leading. Um, you think you do, but really my experience is you're not so sure. You're, you're often wrong. And um, from the very beginning of my work in education, I became very, very interested in um, how children who had learning disabilities, uh, how their brains worked. And for reasons I still cannot understand, um, my very first job in education was in a special school for kids with learning disabilities. I was thrilled to get it, but I don't know why they hired me. I had no particular experience. Um, but it turned out to be just perfect for me. But finally, um, I realized that I needed a different, a different degree. And so I decided uh, the only program for me that I could find um, <clears throat> that would uh, help me um, progress in, in this area and give me the credentials that I needed was this program called Mind, Brain, and Education. 
which was at Harvard University. And I entered that program and um, immediately I realized, oh my goodness, there's this whole other area I don't know anything about. And that's early development. I had a friend um, who sadly isn't with us anymore, but um, who was a, a world-class scientist. And I was explaining this new science of early development that links experience and heredity in the outcomes. And I was explaining how that worked to him. And he remembered the Iowa story. He'd been told the Iowa story by his mentor at Rockefeller University. And now I had these two figures who I knew to be really um, first-class scientists who were telling me, um, one at a distance and Eric there, um, about the Iowa story. And I said, how come I'm a psychologist? How come I don't know about this? And um, so I decided I wanted to know more and I started looking into it. Um, and at that point, um, I realized that it was much more complicated than I ever thought. And um, that I, I just, it would, it would be quite a, a, an interesting journey to find out what had been going on. I think this would be a good point at which to, to fill in a little background. I, I'm guessing uh, most viewers have heard of eugenics, maybe some may be more mm -hmm. aware of the history of that than others. Um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how eugenics uh, came to be, what was going on with that at the time of the story of the orphans of Davenport and, and the role that it plays in this, in this story. Sure. Um, when I started this research, um, which was essentially a research, and I worked in 12 different archives. When I started this research, I did not have any idea that eugenics, which of course I'd heard about, everybody's heard about it, what is it? Um, I had no idea that it would become um, what I think of now as the wallpaper for this story. Uh, and so eugenics was an effort that <clears throat> evolved in um, Great Britain uh, around the middle of the 19th century. And um, it was thought then that people who had came from families of prominence and of achievement uh, could pass on their genes to their offspring. And that people who didn't come from those kinds of families, they were kind of out of luck and they should be prevented from, or discouraged, in, in Great Britain it was discouraged, um, from reproducing. And that that would create uh, a society of the able, um, a kind of flourishing of ability, and nations that, that promoted that would be in a good position in the world. And people in the US took a very different view of eugenics that landed here. Um, it was, the, the eugenics in the Great Britain was called positive eugenics. Let's just encourage people to have more children, you know, the right people, to, like people like us, to have more children. Um, the eugenics in the United States was called neg negative eugenics. And it wanted to eliminate or segregate away people of lower, um, what they thought were lower abilities or lower achievement. And so they wanted to put them into institutions. And by 1927, our Supreme Court had given permission to not just um, institutionalize, but also to sterilize people um, who were usually sterilizing women, sterilizing people of lower social economic status, of lower educational achievement. And um, every state in the United States did that. It had a very profound effect on the early 20th century in the United States, and um, especially in psychology. Uh, and it fueled the use of intelligence testing because if you could test someone's intelligence and you could find out 
that they had low intelligence, you made the assumption that they had bad genetics. And then you took those people and you institutionalized them and or sterilized them. And so, as we know, uh, uh, even worse than that, um, uh, when we look at the, third, the rise of the Third Reich in Germany. That's right. That's, that was the ultimate then outcome of, of what was really bad science. Then we murdered, wow. exactly. That's wow. Right. Well, let's, um, let's bring David into the conversation um, because at this point, Marilyn is looking to uh, find primary research material about uh, the studies that were done on the orphans of Davenport. And so um, she arrives at your doorstep, David, uh, uh, literally or figuratively, depending. Um, and uh, so, how, where did you uh, direct Marilyn and what, what are the collections in the archives um, that you were able to share with her? It seemed clear from the onset in my conversations with Marilyn that she would be interested in consulting the records of the Iowa Child Welfare Research Station. Marilyn just gave a, an excellent background of the impact of eugenics in the United States in the early 20th century. And it was against this backdrop that the Iowa Child Welfare Research Station was organized uh, here at the University of Iowa. It was um, enacted by a law of the Iowa legislature in 1917. And it was done so at the behest of um, what today would be the PTA. Uh, the National uh, Congress of Mothers was the name of the uh, organization that really uh, uh, initiated this uh, program at, uh, at Iowa uh, in 1917. Cora Bussey Hillis was uh, 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 instrumental in the establishment of these uh, programs. And so against that backdrop that Marilyn just described nationally, this uh, program emerges uh, at Iowa and the the, the key players who were involved uh, during that time were very much interested in developing the, uh, shall we say, the development of the study of child development. I didn't mean to use those two words in different contexts in the same sentence, but essentially that's what it was. It, this was an emerging discipline. And it was ripe at Iowa because at the time, the uh, dean of the graduate college, Carl Seashore, uh, himself a psychologist, thought that it would be uh, absolutely appropriate to establish a, a program such as this in order to further the uh, uh, discipline of, of, uh, of child development and, and, and all of its aspects. Now, the, uh, the first director, uh, Marilyn mentioned Harold Skeels. There were uh, a number of other key players. I'll mention a couple of them. The uh, founding director was Bird Baldwin, who unfortunately died at a young age. Uh, he died in 1928, barely uh, 10 years after the uh, research station had been founded. But he really laid the groundwork for the Iowa Child Welfare Research Station to begin to produce quantifiable research in the physical development of children. And so the records that we have at the university archives date to the, the, those early years, pre, uh, pre-1928 when, uh, when Baldwin uh, passed away. Uh, and so we, we do have in our collection uh, at the university archives, we have correspondence, we have subject files, uh, and, and there are case records uh, as well. Uh, altogether about 35 linear feet. Um, imagine a bookshelf that measures out to uh, uh, 30 plus feet of uh, document boxes. And so we, we had a substantial amount of material that uh, hopefully would have uh, uh, and, and indeed proved that it was of, uh, of use to uh, Marilyn's research. I mentioned Harold, uh, Marilyn already mentioned Harold Skeels. I mentioned Bird Baldwin, another a uh, significant player in this period uh, throughout the 1930s was Beth Wellman. Uh, Beth Wellman was a, a PhD uh, uh, who was a professor of child psychology at Iowa and really initiated uh, the uh, 
uh, the research at uh, in, the, in the Davenport study that Marilyn has already uh, mentioned. And I think it gives rise to what today I think we might use very uh, casually or informally in conversation, the uh, ancient nature versus nurture uh, uh, development. Um, you know what uh, which is it and uh, as if they are mutually exclusive i won't go into any of that i'll i'll leave that to the uh, uh the, the professionals in the field but but this was a very exciting uh period at iowa throughout the 1930s this uh, emerging research was not without controversy um but in going through our biographical file of uh, dr wellman i came across this uh, article reprint that appeared in Parents Magazine, which in 1939, uh, and the headline reads, Can an IQ Change? And she writes of the, uh, uh, the impact of environmental uh, factors in, in the development of a child in terms of their intelligence. This was very controversial at the time. And uh, the fact that she shared this article in, in uh, popular literature like Parents Magazine, uh, in addition to the uh, scholarly publishing that uh, she and her colleagues at Iowa had done at the time, uh, tells me that it was having quite a wide impact in the, uh, uh, not only in academic circles, but uh, in, in family circles. Yeah, it, it, it leaped from um, academic uh, understanding to the kitchen table is, is, is really what happened. And, you know, it's important to say that when Beth Wellman in 1932 first discovered that children who attended nursery school uh, for more hours than other children had higher intelligence. This was something she didn't believe could even happen. She, she and the other people in Iowa in those years, early years, were just stumbling around in the dark. They were dancing in the dark. Um, and they, um, by because they didn't understand what was going on, they pushed and pushed for more research to try and figure out how could that be? I mean, it was just intelligence was just not thought to change. It was hereditary and it was what you got what you got. You got this amount and um, that was it. So, um, David, you mentioned the Child Welfare Research Station, um, the documents and records uh, of, of that organization. Um, but Marilyn, you found, uh, you found materials in a lot of uh, different collections. There are the Kent, there's the Kent photograph collection. David, maybe you could um, tell the viewers a little bit about that. And then, sure. of course, the, the infamous uh, vertical files, uh, <laughs> which have been the, uh, a treasure trove and uh, uh, an adventure for many of us, uh, both patrons and employees alike. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about those collections. Sure. Well, uh, I'll uh, take on the Kent photo collection first. The Kent collection is named for Frederick uh, W. Kent. Uh, Fred Kent was the uh, University of Iowa photographer for over a half century, and he spent uh, nearly his entire uh, professional career documenting events uh, pertaining to the university, both on and off campus. From about 19... 20 up until the late 1960s, early 1970s. And the collection today really forms the nucleus of additional photographs that we have since received that are thematically part of university history. And so in Fred Kent's time, it was not unusual for him to visit various programs on campus to take photographs of uh, people involved, whether they were faculty or uh, perhaps human subjects, uh, patients at the university hospitals. There were certainly a lot of uh, other photographs pertaining to the campus landscape itself, but of, of particular interest, I think, for Marilyn's book are photographs that document the um, uh, what we have since realized are some misidentified photographs that uh, some of which identify the uh, Davenport Orphanage, uh, others identify the uh, University Experimental Schools, and we need to still need to clean that up. Uh, an archivist's work is never done. We have a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, 
uh, backlog to do in processing collections. And often in our very well-established collections, we have some uh, mopping up to do, but we have our uh, users to thank for that. Uh, Marilyn brought that to my attention and uh, I will, uh, I promise Marilyn, I will get to the bottom of it. I haven't yet, no, uh, but I will. <laughs> but the, uh, what the here. because the Kent collection really was taking pictures of the laboratory school that the university yeah. was running. And you can, and it was very interesting to me as a researcher to look at those children um, who were in the laboratory school because they came from middle and upper class homes. Their hair was cut and shiny. They were well dressed. They sat in circles and listen, you can see into the photographs. They're avidly listening. You can see them playing and being interested. But if you think about the um, preschool that was established on the Davenport campus, um, that was those children weren't anything like these children. And no one really took too many pictures of them because they weren't cute, you know? And um, they were, they, they'd never played with anything. They had no idea what to do with a toy or a book. In fact, their first reaction to books was to rip out the pages. And that's what they did for about six months when this um, day school was, was first started at Davenport. So the, the, the the contrast is so instructive, um, you know, David, it, it's just a remarkable difference. It's a very important point of distinction. And it also, I think, illustrates for us again, what motivates uh, a photographer or an author to create the work that they create. In Fred Kent's case, he was employed by the university and presumably was instructed or, or uh, of his own volition, prepared photographs that cast the university in a positive light. And, you know, that's, uh, that's marketing, I suppose. And that's what we, uh, what we uh, work with in terms of the types of historical records we sometimes inherit. But I think it serves as a useful uh, consumer warning that uh, uh, these types of records sometimes are created with a, a particular goal or agenda in mind. And uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that uh, is the case with uh, a number of our photographic holdings. Um, but you know, one, one thing that's also, I think, very interesting that I did find in one of the files, don't, I don't remember exactly which one was, I found a program from these conferences that the Iowa Station used to have every summer for educators. And in that one of those um, conference programs, I discovered that Harold Skeels was a photographer and that he had created um, an eight millimeter film of the orphan children he had sent to Glenwood School um, and a film that was later lost, but um, it was shown at that conference. And also I discovered that Grant Wood was at the university at that time. And he had given a talk at that very same meeting um, about the importance of art in children's lives. So, you know, you, you just, you know, who there, would have there, that Yeah, you know? there are a lot of intersections that, that happen. And uh, I guess that uh, leads me to the second part of your question, Rich, the vertical files. And these are, Quite literally, file cabinets. We have rows of them in our uh, secured stacks at the Department of Special Collections and Archives. And I think most archives have one or two or more file cabinets like this. And these are what I would call the incidental files that are arranged. Well, the clinical term for archivists would be they are arranged artificially. They are an artificial collection. We receive material that we drop into the appropriate folder because we think that it matches that topic. And we uh, in, indeed had uh, a number of vertical files that uh, uh, proved useful for, uh, uh, for Maryland's research. Yeah, you, you very, very much did. And um, it was in those vertical files that I found, for example, um, a transcript of a meeting with the leading eugenicist uh, journalist of the time, uh, a guy named Albert Will Wiggum, uh, who met, sat down actually and met with the people at the Iowa station. Uh, this meeting occurred in about 1938. And uh, surprisingly, 
he was very, very open to hearing their ideas. And I was very amazed. Uh, and it's a transcript of 17 pages. I mean, really? Types? You know, there was obviously a stenographer there. Type pages. Um, and uh, some of the most important ideas that I encountered about how the Iowa people were thinking, I learned from that transcript. Um, it was, you know, it was almost like being in the room. And um, so that was just invalu an invaluable resource for me. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how a researcher discovers these sorts of documents. Um, if there's someone out there who is doing research there, they could be a fiction writer and they want to set uh, their book in uh, a certain time period uh, or someone who's doing genealogical research. Um, uh, there are things called finding aids that, um, that aid the researchers in discovering uh, these kinds of documents. And David, maybe you could start by talking a little bit about how these finding aids are made and how people access them. Sure. Well, a finding aid is uh, uh, another term for collection guide. It's a guide to materials within a collection. Uh, it's no substitute for the material itself, but it is intended to serve as, a, a, as an inventory and description of the material so that users can at least attempt to pinpoint boxes or even within boxes certain folders that they may wish to access in the course of their research. Um, finding aids come in many different styles. Some are very detailed and they may get down to the very granular level of description in a collection, even down to the uh, uh, document level, if not folder level. That's really unusual. We don't have the staff or, or the resources to create finding aids across the board for all of our hundreds of collections to uh, accomplish that. We do have, I think, more, uh, much more likely, we have finding aids that are at a more general level. They give you a general sense of what the box contents are, and they can be used. They can still be useful in terms of guiding the uh, user, but it may take a, a, a more than a little more time probably to pour through everything to get to what the uh, user may be uh, seeking out. But the the, the rationale for collections and the way that they are created uh, in, in the realm of archives is that we base collections uh, and, and their descriptions not so much on their uh, subject area as we do with books, but rather with provenance. And so you are, as a researcher, um, it's going to be up to you to use a little bit of creativity to identify collections that may be appropriate for, uh, for what you're seeking. I think that's a really important point, David, because, you know, when you're a researcher <clears throat> trying to make your way through, you know, mountains of material, um, you just never know when you're going to come upon a gem. And <clears throat> so it, you, you kind of have to have the, the mindset that I'm just going to look at every every single piece of paper that comes into my hand and and see what's there a lot of it won't be valuable but then once in a while something will just light up and um that happened to me multiple multiple times in in my research um it was uh just actually very surprising to me um how how important just being assiduous about every single piece of paper, um, because you just don't know what you're going to find. Marilyn, can you can you tell us about some of the surprising things that you found um, sure. through this process? Sure, I can. Um, for example, when I read the letters of Grant Wood to George Stoddard and George Stoddard to Grant Wood, which are in the vertical file, and um, can you tell people, I don't think George Stoddard has come up yet. Maybe okay, you could just so introduce him briefly. Was, thanks. Right. Uh, George Stoddard was the uh, person who replaced Bert Baldwin as the director of the Iowa station. And he was um, a very remarkable and different sort of person. 
Uh, he was extremely self-confident. He was brilliant. He was very articulate. And when he was an under, just after he finished um, his undergraduate studies and speaking no French, he took himself to France, to the Sorbonne, and he decided he wanted to study with the um, person who had been another very famous psychologist, um, Alfred Benet's um, colleague. Uh, his name was Theodore Simon. Benet had, had died, but Simon took Stoddard on and allowed him to go through all, and I found this out from, you know, Stoddard wrote a book about it, but I also found it out from letters Stoddard wrote. Um, he allowed Stoddard to go through all of Benet's files. The important thing here is Benet believed that environment changed intelligence. And no one in America did. But in France, that wasn't an unusual idea. And Stoddard brought that back to the Iowa station. Then he went on to get his doctorate there. Uh, Bert Baldwin died and Stoddard was asked to become the director of the Iowa station. So now the Iowa station is being led by somebody um, who is very, not so, Bert Baldwin also had some of these ideas, but, but Stoddard was much more outspoken than Bert Baldwin. And you see that in their letters. Um, and so Stoddard uh, became a, a very, very important person. And then when Grant Wood, the, who was at the time the most famous American painter, the most recognized American painter, um, uh, got into some trouble and was being attacked by his own uh, Iowa department chair, um, a guy named Longwood. Um, there, there developed a correspondence between those two people. And you could see how empathic um, Stoddard was and how he helped Wood and how Wood came to rely on him. Um, and that was a marvelous piece because someone in Stoddard's own department in the, um, in the Iowa station was also very attacked, although not by somebody at Iowa and for the same reasons. So, so it, was, it was just an amazing um, sign of piecing, piecing together a story here that had never been told. And the only way I could do that was because I had these letters. And I've read uh, a review of your book that describes it as character driven, which I, which I think is really uh, interesting for a book of this type because um, you really do bring these characters to life and you're able to do that through these sort of personal correspondences. Exactly. Um, that sort of brings up an issue of, of privacy, which a, a lot of people, you know, it's a very contemporary issue with uh, digital privacy, but by the same token, much of uh, this correspondence, um, although the, the characters are uh, all primarily um, passed away uh, by this point, but, but David, what, are the, uh, what can you tell us about the sort of restrictions or how do you handle issues of privacy uh, within the collections and the archives? There, is, uh, there, there are a number of aspects to this question. I'll uh, address a couple of them. There is a general rule of thumb that, the, uh, uh, the, the, that, that an individual's claim to privacy ceases upon death. That is a very general rule, however, and it really doesn't address the matter of third party rights. Let's say that uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, person who received the letter or an individual who is referred to in that letter, um, what of those? And those are, those are complicated uh, issues at times. The, uh, uh, but in the case of the uh, uh, research station records, the federal HIPAA law, HIPAA is uh, an acronym for the uh, Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. This is a law that was enacted back in 1996 to mainly ensure that contemporary medical records not be 
divulge to third parties without the consent of the individuals involved. Uh, that's the, uh, the short answer. And the intent was to, uh, and is to curtail fraud in the healthcare industry. But it also, uh, of course, is intended to protect the privacy of individuals who may or may not have consented to uh, certain uh, uh, forms of experimentation. Um, the, the complications arise, uh, and, and in terms of HIPAA, the, uh, uh, the, again, the right, of, the right to privacy uh, for individuals who are uh, in, in some way uh, named or identified in medical records, uh, those records uh, cannot become public or, or be publishable until 50 years after the death of that individual. Now, in the case of the uh, Iowa Child Welfare Research Station records, these were uh, uh, transferred to the university archives back in uh, the early 1980s, probably not very long after the station had closed in 1974. Uh, by that time, it was known as the Institute of Child Behavior and Development. Um, there is a gray area in terms of accessing those types of records. Uh, the individuals very well uh, might even today still be living. They are perhaps in their 90s if, if they are. But the, uh, the, the, the provision of the law is such that so long as the identity of individuals uh, is not divulged, um, we, uh, we, we are not violating uh, anyone's privacy. But I would defer to Marilyn in terms of, of ultimately what her decision was with, with regard to that. This is a collection that we had, uh, as I said, had, uh, had for at least 40 years in our holdings. And uh, I saw no restrictions uh, so noted at the time of, of uh, transfer. So um, Harold Skeels died in 1970, um, which means as of 1920, 50 years had passed since his death. Um, and uh, the uh, people at Norton uh, and I discussed um, some of this because um, I began to get an, an understanding of Harold Skeels that was entirely different from the one I originally had. Um, at Skills was very, very uh, targeted um, by uh, some of American psychologists, the leading American psychologists who were eugenicists for his views. He was more targeted even than the other uh, people who were um, at the station at the same time. And uh, there's from Maurice Skodak. There are comments that suggest that Harold um, might have been um, a closeted homosexual. And um, she doesn't act, say that, but one can't ex escape the idea that perhaps that had something to do in the 1930s with his being targeted, since uh, that was exactly what was going on with Grant Wood at the same time, and with many other people. Um, and so, I looked for other evidence um, about his sexuality and about the fact that he might be hiding something um, because if he admitted to this, um, he would have lost his position. He would have lost his, no one would have taken his work seriously. And I think George Stoddard really tried to protect him and did protect him. Um, and the evidence that I found uh, really had to do with how his, behavior changed after these attacks began. So here was a guy who was a bullion and who um, had a lot of friends and who um, was able to organize all kinds of research studies because people liked him and he could uh, call together his relationships from various parts of Iowa and the Iowa Station and um, other, other uh, institutions. And he became very secretive and uh, didn't talk about himself and never let anyone know in the future what work he had done. So he went on to NIMH and um, at NIMH, he worked 
uh, supervising someone by the name of Simon Oster. Uh, and Simon uh, was a psychiatrist. And Simon had no idea what Skeels had done in Iowa, none. And we know that from Simon's letters. And Simon's letters to um, a very famous psychologist in Great Britain, um, who, in fact, this woman, Margaret Lowenfeld, invented child therapy, <laughs> play therapy. And um, Simon, she asked Simon to get information for her about other psychologists, and he looked into Skeels, and he was no longer working with Skeels, but he was astonished to discover what Skeels had done in Iowa. This was uh, 30 years later, and he had no idea. Wow, amazing. And, he, and this is all in letters that he wrote and she wrote, which I also found. I didn't find those here. I found those in another archive. So that opened up a whole area for me. Why did this man hide? And then I found Simon, and I was able to interview Simon Oster twice. And um, Simon told me that he said he was just very private. It wasn't personal. He didn't hold anything against you, but he never talked about his own life. Maurice Skodak said the same thing about him. So um, I said, something's going on here. I never come out and say he was a homosexual. I can't. You know, I consulted with another writer, um, Chip uh, Evans, who wrote the Grant Wood biography. And I, and I told him that I just didn't know what to do. And he said, Marilyn, you have an obligation and a responsibility to, this sounds like you have enough evidence from that time. Nobody wrote that down then. It was just a different time. And um, so I went with it, but I can tell you that my editors at Norton weren't that happy about it. They didn't stop me. And it went through their legal department but it's, and it's in my book, but it wasn't um, something they liked. This is a dilemma that researchers encounter in instances where there are attempts to document the lives of people who yeah. are essentially sanctioned by the state. They cannot, they must not document the truth of themselves. And it was only really, uh, fairly recently that the type of self-documented truth can be, uh, can be revealed. And it's, it's tragic, really, but it's also uh, a consequence of the types of records that we have at our disposal to, uh, to work with. Mm -hmm. Well, we are rapidly running out of time, uh, but I'd like to wrap up by asking each of you um, if you can give a little advice uh, to researchers. Marilyn, maybe you could start by um, giving advice to researchers who want to embark on a project for the first time using archives. And, and David, maybe you could uh, take a shot at that from the position of an archivist and, and maybe uh, tell uh, users a little bit about how they might um, use the University of Iowa archives uh, as an outside researcher. You know, um, the only place I think a researcher is going to find um, the fascinating trail uh, that may reveal some truths um, is, in, is in archives. And, um, you know, I, I feel like if I could get up every day and go to an archive, that would be my very best life. Um, the thrill of discovering something no one else knew, no one else guessed, is something that's hard even to describe in any way that, you know, won't make you sound like an idiot. But, um, but that really um, was one of the most wonderful parts of working in the archives um, at Iowa and then all these others that I went to. That's a, that's a great description. And it's, uh, that kind of passion is... Uh... It, it's what makes uh, what makes doing this kind of work fun on a day to day basis for sure. Um, David, uh, would you like to wrap up with a few comments? Well, I, I really appreciated hearing Marilyn's insights, both uh, with regard to her experience here, but also at uh, other institutional repositories. 
it's a really, uh, it, it can be a really amazing experience for a researcher to go into an archive. So I would invite people to look at our website, look at other institutions' websites, check out a database called Archive Finder. There are research libraries which subscribe to this, including the University of Iowa. If you have a Hawk ID, or even if you don't, you can get a guest pass and you can access Archive Finder and identify literally thousands of collections across North America that may be pertinent to the topic that you're researching. I just have to say that archives are for everyone. They're not only for uh, academic researchers, but they're for uh, genealogists, historic preservationists who are researching property that they are uh, seeking to get a grant for to, uh, to preserve. And uh, I dare say it's for the uh, sports trivia buff who wants to settle an argument. We, we have all kinds of information and we're always ready to help. So um, reach out to us, ask any of us on staff questions you might have and we'll do our best to steer you in that direction. Great. Well, this has been a great conversation. I thank you both, uh, author Marilyn Brookwood, uh, author of the Orphans of Davenport and University of Iowa archivist David McCartney. Thank you both. And uh, I've really enjoyed this discussion. I, I know our viewers will too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rich.